Hi, uh, this is James Space, uh, speaking from Fairfield, Iowa, for the Ayurveda Cafe, number two, which we are holding each Wednesday evening for the young, for how many weeks, I don't know, but uh, this is our second week. Uh, I'd like to pick up a little bit where I left off previously, last Wednesday, at that, last Wednesday, I introduced myself, I introduced Vajra Ramakant Mishra, and I introduced his lineage, Shakavansha Ayurveda. And I want to uh, perhaps make that a shorter, but to repeat who Vajra Mishra is. Uh, Vajra Mishra is an Ayurvedic physician who trained in India with a degree, but uh, after his graduation, he interned with his father, Kameshwar Mishra, for seven years to learn a lineage of Ayurveda, which is known as Shakabansha Ayurveda, which is a lineage of knowledge, a lineage of pure Ayurveda, as taught 5,000 years ago in the time of Lord Krishna. And that knowledge of pure Ayurveda, should Ayurveda, has been passed down from generation to generation for 5,000 years, and the most recent uh, recipient of that knowledge was Vajrayama Mishra, who, as many of you know, passed away from us uh, in 2017. But his work goes on, his products that he created over the many years, his 700 plus chronically intelligent herbal synergies are still being produced and distributed through his company, Chandika.com in Chatsworth, California. I work for uh, Chandika. I do a lot of different projects, writing projects, uh, video transcriptions of Vajramisha's lectures, his DVDs, his, CD, his CDs, etc. And during these years, I've learned much deep knowledge of Ayurveda, which I would uh, have been thinking for years to share more with uh, people here in Fairfield, Iowa, and through this YouTube channel with you folks out there listening. Because uh, many of you have heard about Ayurveda, and many of you know Ayurveda is, when people talk about Ayurveda, a lot of times they just think about, oh, Ayurveda talks about Bada Pitta Kapha, and Ayurveda talks about herbal remedies, and that's true, but that's a small part of Ayurvedic knowledge. Dr. Mishra's way of doing Ayurveda is, um, I, I, it, it has a different angle, and that's what we're gonna talk about tonight to begin with, what is his way of understanding and applying Ayurveda. Of course, the doshas and Bada Pitta Kapha are a part of that, but again, we have to ask the questions, well, where does what, pit, pit, what where do the doshas arise from? What's before that? Like our bodies doesn't don't start with dosha. There are things before that that we have to understand. So we'll talk about that. But to go back to our very uh, and also we last week we talked about how Baja Mishra likes to teach, which is not just to teach, talk, talk, talk. He, he likes to give sutras from an ancient text. And there's thousands and thousands of sutras from the Charak Samhita, from the Bhagavad, the work of, from Bob Mishra, from uh, these, these books called Nigantus. There are literally <laughs> endless numbers of sutras. So if you come to get the books of Ayurveda, the ancient texts, you'll be lost. It's, it's, it's too much. So he narrows it down. He selected the main sutras for whatever class he was teaching. And mainly, he, and from Sushruta Samhita also, but his main textbook was the Charak Samhita. And he said, my father taught me, this is our Bible. This is our family Bible of Ayurveda. Whatever's in this book of the Charak Samhita is in the world. And whatever's in the world is in this book. He said, they, they, there's nothing out there that's not in the book. There's nothing in the book that's not out there in reality, in our experience, in our day-to-day -day life. It's all there. 
So the, the, tech, the main textbook that he uses, and a lot of people use in the Ayurvedic college, is called Charak Samhita. Um, but to understand that Charak Samhita, you need someone very, very thoroughly indoctrinated in that, learning that Samhita and then learning how to apply it. Someone who knows Sanskrit, but not just knows Sanskrit, who knows Ayurveda, you have to have both. You can know Sanskrit and still not understand Charak Samhita. So you have to have your background in the Sanskrit as well as practical knowledge of Ayurveda. And Bhadra Mishra was definitely fulfilling both of those roles. Understood Sanskrit very well, understood the meaning of Sanskrit, but more than that, he understood applying the knowledge. He used to say it's like, Okay, you know, you, you know how to build a rocket ship. You understand all the parts, everything that's working, but you don't know how to sh- you don't know how to fire the rocket. You don't know how to how to shoot the rocket. What good is it to you if you don't know how to use the knowledge? Because Ayurveda is about it's very practical. And he told me that he said my father told me that whatever you teach should be practical. Don't teach just theory. You're wasting your time. If you're going to talk about something, you have to have a practical way to make it useful and to help life, to help people's health. So that's the, that was his approach, Sutra to Science, it's called, wherein he would uh, validate ancient text findings by modern science, medical science, and uh, you know from hospitals and doctors and from pharmaceutical companies, whatever it may be. But science supports. The text. That's what he's finding more and more. They haven't caught up to the text yet, but maybe one day they will. <laughs> you know. And that brings us to the understanding of what is the Veda. Because we have, we're going to talk about Ayurveda, we have to understand what is the Veda. Basically, Veda is pure knowledge, which it never changes. It's the not. It's um, originated from nature's rhythm. Uh, it's always pure and it's always the same. Like turmeric, which Ayurveda knows about for thousands of years, was never recalled. What they said about it 5,000 years ago, what they, uh, through what they experienced using it in practice, it never changed. It's not like the modern drugs and Western medicine. There's, we know we have lots of recalls. It means if you have a recall, there's something wrong with the knowledge, right? If you recall a product, an herb, a drug, or a drug, we should say, that means the knowledge that created that drug, there was some lack of knowledge in making it, if you recalled it. But Ayurveda never had a recall. Roger Mitchell liked to say, there's no doubts, there's no buts, there's no ifs. It, that's the Vedic knowledge. The source of Ayurveda is from the Veda. And it's a pure knowledge. And so again, pure source is Veda, is the Veda of life. And now what is life? But before I go into what is life, I want to use our last sutra from last week, which tells us what Ayurveda is. Because a lot of people ask them why is Ayurveda, they'll talk about what we do in Ayurveda. We'll talk about, well, we use herbs, we use a diet, we pay attention to these doshic principles, a lot of bit of copper, but they really can't come up with a very good definition of Ayurveda, but, but there's a definition. And like any definition, there are simple definitions and there are more complicated definitions. But the one that I think is the best is, is Ayur, Hita, Ahitam, Niyadi, Nidanam, Shamanam, Tata, Vidyate, Yatra, Vidvad Bihi, Sa Ayurveda Uchite. So Ayurveda is the wisdom that tells us what is Hita, beneficial for our life, what is Ahita, what is not beneficial for our life. And it tells us what are the diseases, the Niyadi, and it tells us Nidanam, what are the causes of disease, the Nidanam. And it tells us how to pacify disease, shamanam. And who says this? 
the Vidwans, the wise people, they say, wherever you find this, that is Ayurveda. Wherever in the world you find it, whatever system does this, that's Ayurveda. So it doesn't mean Ayurveda only in India. It's wherever you find any science or medical science or way of healing that approaches healing from this perspective of understanding what's good for your life, what is bad for your life, what are the all about the knowledge of diseases, what are the K2, the Nidan, the reason for the disease, and how to pacify the disease. If they do that, that's Ayurveda, whether it be in India, Brazil, China, wherever that may be. But Bhaja Mishra would often say, he says, I've read every other medical system, every other book, every other you know, healing system in the world, and yet have I found this approach to healing. So that can't, those healing systems cannot be called Ayurveda. They may have a piece here and there that matches, but they don't have the complete knowledge. So another thing about Ayurveda to understand and the Veda itself, there's a sutra that says, uh, Satya Sampurnagan, which means it's true and it's complete. That is the knowledge, the gun that is completely full. Nothing's missing, nothing's lacking. There's no shortcomings. And it's true. Because a lot of times people know a little bit about Ayurveda and it's true, but it's not complete. It's not Sampurna. It is such a what they talk about, perhaps, but it's not Sampurna God. It's not complete. For example, when he was with Maharishi Ayurveda in Holland, he said, you know, a lot of people talk about, well, when you sit down to eat, you should stimulate your appetite with some sliced ginger, some salt, some lime juice, some lemon juice. Take that before your meal. And uh, just get your digestive enzymes stimulated. So he was in Holland, bull drop with Maharishi and on the table, there was all these slices of ginger and salt and slices of lemon and some hot water. And he wasn't taking it. And some of the people sitting there, well, why your mission? Why aren't you taking the ginger pickle before you eat like we are doing, like these other guys just told us to do? He said, are you, are you crazy? <laughs> he said, my pit is already bubbling. I don't need that. He says, there is a sutra in the text that says it, who, who should do it, but there's also a sutra that follows who should not do it. And he says, they don't pay attention to the part who should not do it. They just pay attention to the part who should do it. So again, that's an example of the knowledge is true, but it's not full. It's not complete. It's partial. And he, always, and he would always say, if you're going to practice Ayurveda, you must know the whole Ayurveda. Otherwise, you make a mistake. And that's, that's bound to be true with any, any discipline. If you don't really understand it deep enough, you'll make mistakes. So that is the Satya Sampurnagan, which is Ayurveda. And then we want to talk about, because uh, the nights, the, the main topic of tonight's talk is what is life? Um, what is prana and three sutra Ayurveda, a principle called three sutra Ayurveda, which is how Bhaja Mishra practiced Ayurveda, three sutra Ayurveda from the Charak Samhita, and also how he always taught his students and his doctors, his chiropractors, his MDs that he trained, how they should always approach Ayurveda from this uh, three sutra Ayurveda principle. But that's at the end, we'll talk about that. So first, what is Ayu? What is life? Ayu means life, but what is life? And we can find different opinions about what is life. Even different Ayurvedic doctors, they have different opinions about what is life. But one of Vajramishra's uh, relatives from his lineage was uh, an author, an author whose name is P.V. Sharma. 
who wrote a, a book or a text called the Ayurveda Darshan. And the definition that they use, P.V. Sharma uses, and his lineage that his father used also, Vajramesha's father, is called, to define life, is Deha Prana Samyoge Ayuhu. So Deha means the body. Prana, we will talk what is Prana. Samyoge means that combination, that balance combination, Samyoga, Samyoge, that is life. So basically it's very simple to understand. So long as prana flows in the physiology, we are alive and that is life because that is the life we treat as an Ayurvedic practitioner, an Ayurvedic physician. You know, there's a different, again, different definitions of life, but for us, as long as life is flowing in our body, we're alive. So that is the definition of life. Deha, body, prana, some yoga, the union of prana with the body, basically. Very simple, very easy. The vital force, the cosmic electromagnetic power of nature, the prana. And the flow of prana is life. When prana goes, life is no longer there. If someone passes, they're not injured, they could, they could pass away in front of us. At that point, we may not know if they're alive or just sleeping, right? We don't know. Perhaps we don't know. I'm just making, a, I'm making it simple here. Maybe we don't know, but the prana is no longer there. Prana is no longer circulating through the vibrational channels of the body, which are called nadi, vibrational channels which deliver prana to every organ, system, cell, atom, subatomic particle, everything. That's life. More prana, better life you have. Which is what, when we really, when we say what is beneficial for our life and what is not beneficial, we really are saying those things, whether it be the diet, the food, the lifestyle, the thinking, meditation, uh, good and bad, or beneficial, not beneficial. What supports prana? What is good for our prana to flow? Or what is not good for our pranic flow. We don't get good sleep, ahitam, not good for our pranic flow, because when we get good sleep, we have better, we have better prana and better energy the next day, better sensory function, better digestive function, better eliminatory function, better digestion, better everything, better thinking, better emotions, healthy emotions. If not, maybe we're cranky, our heart. In our emotion, our mind and our heart are not connected. We don't have enough prana, for example. Uh, so prana is basically everything. <laughs> so I'm going to try to explain what this prana is, and it can be, it can be very simple, or it can be very not theoretical, but very cosmic. So I'm going to try to make it cosmic and practical at the same time. So first, what is um, prana? Well, if you understand Sanskrit, we always, you can break every Sanskrit word down into the syllables. They're called matrikas, the Vedic syllables, the Vedic sounds. So pra means specific. Where do you see that prefix pra? It means specific. And a is the first sound of creation. So it's the specific a in action. Bhaji says there's really just one prana. But that one prana becomes the prana in every living, every living organism. But really, in, from one, one perspective, there's just one prana. So A ah is that cosmic beginning. It's A. Ah, that's the silence becomes beginning to warm up a little bit, we could say. That's the A, ah, the first sound. Uh, but it's not manifested in any shape, form, or fashion yet. So prana is the tendency for the unmanifest to become manifest. That's another way of looking at prana. But it's that specific eye that's now doing something in something, somebody, somewhere, some plant, some human, some animal, 
at some point in time and space, it's doing something. Um, so, so ah is that first sound of creation, and but ah articulates to become om. You know, you see a o m, but it's really a u m. The I expanding, infinite, 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 but then coming back to the silence, the ma, the om, back to the silence. So ah in action is om. The ah sound in action is om, which is the seat of all creation. The seat of all vibration is om, which itself is articulated from ah. So again, I'm being giving you a bigger cosmic uh, way of thinking about this. So, and Bajra Misha says, we call that Om the Adi Tatwa. Adi means the foremost, the first, the primary. The Tatwa means that, thatness, Tatwa. There's a lot of Tatwas, but the first thing in creation is that Adi Tatwa, that master sound, master vibration, Om. And he says, you can call it Lord Vishnu, you can, whatever God you want to call it. He says, in my tradition, we call it Lord Vishnu. Om is Lord Vishnu, or Vishnu chants Om. Um, but it's the origin of everything. It's the vibrational power of the universe. The origin of everything that exists, every, everything that did exist, everything that will exist, everything that is here now, is Om. That is the Adi Tatwa. It's eternal. So, and it originates from the ah. So om is action. Ah, when ah wants to get into action, it converts itself, transforms itself into om. Um, so this is the origin, but then we're gonna get a little more concrete now, make it a little, a little more concrete. So this om, the Adi Tatwa, creates something called tree, tree tatwa. Three tatwa. So you've got your origin, Om. And then Om will transform into three, three. And there are three, we call them three component of prana. You could call it three component. You could call it three tendencies. But to make it real easy to think about, to get your hands on, to grasp it, we call it three component of prana. And that's called Agni, Soma, and Maru. He usually listed Soma Agni Maru. And what are those three things? Um, I'll use a very simple analogy, then I'll go deeper. Let's say we have a, a battery and we want to, we have cables and we want to, you know, make a light bulb come on through that with that battery. So we have a plus pole, which is like the hot pole, the Agni, right? And then you have the minus pole, which is like the cold pole, the soma. And then you have the flow between them. And that's maru called marut. So these three things that we call adrishya bhuta means you can't see them. You can see that what we call the panchamaha bhuta, the five fundamental elements, those are things we experience. But those elements, the five panchamaha bhuta, which we call drishya bhuta, we can see them, we can touch them, we can smell them, we can hear them, whatever it may be. The five elements are practical day-to-day -day things, but they have their origin from these agni samamaru, from these tree tapwa, which are completely unmanifest. They're adrishya, you can't, they're vibrational, they're pure vibration. They're just a pure vibration, but they create all these five elements, and we'll go into that. So, but to give us an idea of what we mean when we say uh, these three components of prana, soma is lunar energy, and the moon is our source of soma on this earth, in our, our universe, in our universe, our earth. There's a lunar energy, soma. There's a solar energy from the sun, agni. And then there's the etheric energy from space, marut, which is really the space in action, or like air, like space in air the space in action. The Marut 
you will, in the process of creation, the Marut is first from Om. Marut, with the help of Om, creates Agni. Marut and Agni, with the help of Om, are creating uh, Soma. So I know I've made this a little abstract, but I'll get more concrete. Um, so Soma is lunar energy, basically, fundamentally. Agni is solar energy. And Marut is etheric energy. So Soma, we'll talk about Soma first, the lunar energy. This is a vibrational energy which flows in our body, which we will talk about how we get it, but it flows in our body and it's cooling. Sounds like I'm talking about dosha, but again, this is a pure vibration. It's a cooling, it's nurturing, and it's growth giving and it's stabilizing. It creates this, you could say it's the more material aspect of these three pure vibrations. Whereas Marut is the circulating etheric energy. And again, we have all three at the same time. It's just a matter of predominance. So Marut is that circulating energy. That's the flow between the plus and the minus pole. And then you've got the hot pole on the battery, the Agni, which does warming, cooking, transforming, Metab met metabolic energy, all those things that do with digestion, but it's the power behind it. It's the doshas that go to work are the things doing it, but the doshas come from these tree tuple. So the, again, that's a pure vibration, but they sound like dosha, but they're not. They're not a dosha, they're not an impurity. They're not something that goes out of balance. We want lots of prana. We don't want lots of dosha just enough doshas to do their job in our body but but these are the three things so um so soma is like stabilizes agni and maru and maru helps soma to go to where it needs to go in the body for example it's, it's like a flow but vibrational maru is the intelligence decides how much agni needs to be in action at a particular moment in time to digest this or that material and to transform that soma into what type of material in the body. So they all work together like that. Soma, Agni, Maru. And we get these uh, soma, Agni, and Maru from uh, things that have prana because prana has these three components in different proportion. For example, I like to, he likes to use the example about, uh, you know, you have the same soil and you put a chili pepper in that soil, it grows a chili. I mean, you put a chili seed and it grows a chili plant, chili peppers. You put a zucchini seed in that soil, same soil, it doesn't grow chili. What does it grow? It grows zucchini. What's the difference? Well, zucchini is not chili. Chili has a lot of agni. Soma, the zucchini has a lot of soma. It's cooling for the body and stabilizing. So what's the difference? Why does one seed do one thing, one seed does the other thing? And our body does the same thing, according to uh, something we call Prakriti. Chili gets more agni from the environment to grow the chili pepper. The soma, the zucchini seed, receives more lunar energy from the environment to grow a vegetable which has more soma, which when we eat it, if we cook it properly and digest it properly and spice it properly, we get that soma for our body, for our need, just as we get agni from the chili. If we need more agni, you know, chili is a wonderful thing. We need a lot of agni to open our channels, our physical channels are all clogged, they're all blocked, a lot of ama sitting there. Maybe you need to get that agni to open those channels up a bit. And likewise, marut we can get from the bitter vegetables, all things that are bitter, 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 have a lot of marut energy, etheric energy. They make us feel lighter. They're detoxifying. But when you eat a, a bite of chili, you, you're not getting pitta from that chili. It will affect your pitta, but you're not getting pitta. Pit, the doshas are in the body. 
They're in the living body. These Soma Agni Maru are in the universe at large. They're in the environment. And they are in us, flowing in us, and we receive them to our food. We get prana. Where do we get prana from? Everybody would say, oh, we breathe. We get prana. Absolutely correct. But not complete. True, but not complete. Yes, we get prana from breathing. That is one of the primary uh, pathways for receiving prana. A major pathway is through breathing. But we also get prana from uh, food, good food, intelligent food organic food, fresh food, et cetera, et cetera. What makes food good? We, not from dead, can, box, processed food, we don't get prana. Old food, we don't get prana. Dead food, leftover food, next day, we don't get prana, it's gone. Prana's gone. But any good food, good water, even good thinking, even good behavior and good emotions, even from a hug, <laughs> we can get prana. We get so much. Even from a sweet voice, a sweet hello, we can get some vibration, which will increase the soma within us. So these, so prana is the source of our the universe. It's a, it's a source of our body, and there are many avenues that we get it from. We get it from our eyes, they're, they're called the, the margas, the pathways. Where does prana enter? It enters through our eyes, through our nose, through our ears, through the pores of our skin, through our mouths. And uh, so getting prana is, uh, and another source of prana is from om itself, which comes into a marma on top of the head called the maha, the adipati marma. That's, more marut, that is powerful marut energy coming from Om, going through Adipati Marma, down the spine, and down the spine, getting distributed between all the gaps in the vertebra, vibrationally, to every organ and system. Which brings me to a, another great analogy he liked to tell us to understand what is Agni Soma and Marut and how they are related to our body. So for example, you have a home, you have one cable that comes to, to your home for electricity. With that one cable, it runs your refrigerator, it runs your computer, it runs your microwave oven. Hopefully you don't have one because that's not a good way to cook. It runs your toaster oven, it runs your TV, any electrical appliance coming from the one cable. Well, prana is kind of like that. That one cable, that prana, like somebody, organs in the body are high organs, some are cold organs. Some parts of our body need more soma, like our stomach, our lungs. Some need more agni, like our liver, our spleen, our pancreas. Uh, some need more marut, like our heart. But they're all three together. Don't ever forget they work together. But different organs and systems need different proportions, different types of prana different component of prana to make them run. And when it, whenever someone gets sick, it basically means there's less, wherever that disease becomes manifest, means there wasn't enough prana for the kidney, for the colon, for the liver, for the eyes, whatever it may be, there's less prana there, which allows diseases to happen. So Vajra Mishra's way of doing Ayurveda was all about how to enhance the reception, the delivery, the flow, and the interaction of prana with its destination, and how to release use prana. Because prana is like a river. It's fresh, always fresh. So there's something we use prana, and that has to be released out of our body. A lot of times it goes out our feet, it goes out our hands, back to be recycled, we could say, to the universe for recycling. But that's used prana. So for the prana to flow, the used prana has to be eliminated on time, in a timely fashion. So uh, forgive me for going fast about this, but I'm trying to fit it all in. Is there, does anyone have a question at this point about it? 
hands and feet, how do you get rid of the spine? Well, basically, when you breathe out, you're getting okay. rid of uh, the gases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. But vibrationally, pure vibrationally, we, in fact, and his way of... I'll just repeat the question for the video just to make sure okay. that everyone uh, is able to hear. Um, the question was, how do you get rid of used prana? Is it just hands and feet? Well, there's, we, have, we have a technique in Shakta Banshara, we have part of Bajamish's transdermal warmer system where we, we have, he develop transdermal creams, one called Prana Flow, which we apply on our arms, either at least from the elbow down, but sometimes the whole arm is better. And it opens the nadis and it facilitates the flow of prana in the nadis. Those nadis can be shrunken down. I'm not going into all the details about nadis, but they get shrunken down, they get clogged, and the prana doesn't flow. So when you, even if you do this without the cream, you're helping release use prana through your hands, mainly from the upper part of the body. And when you go here, you're helping to release use prana mainly from lower half of the body. But each has an effect overall, you know. But this is mainly how we see it. But the cream, when you use the cream, it's much more effective. The multiples effective because the cream itself opens the nadis and, and helps the product to flow. And in the process, it's releasing use product. Would you say that Abhyanga is, is effective in releasing use prana? To, to a degree, yeah, it is done properly. You know, it's because uh, it's coming down Vata. Right. So even the doshas, Vata Pitakatha, are involved in getting that more prana for us, right? They're created by the prana creates this. Uh, so let me let me go back so we can uh, for advance on that point. So we have Om Adi Tapa. We have three Tapa: Soma, Agni, Maru. So Soma creates. Uh, earth and water element. So there's an earthy soma and there's a watery soma. Agni stays as an agni. Pure fire, pure flame, we call it the pure flame. It's not pitta, pitta is not a pure flame. It's a fuel. <laughs> so that pure flame of agni stays as agni in our terminology. And then you have marut, the etheric circulating energy, which is the most powerful intelligent energy because it decides it decides what needs to be done when in the body. Where Agni needs to be, at what time, how much Agni, how much flame, how much soma is to be transformed, into what kind of material it should be transformed. So, so again, there is a soma, earth, become earth and water, the pancha. We're, now we're talking at the pancha mahabhuta, drishya bhuta, what we can see. So um, you've got Soma, earth and water. So there's earthy soma and there's watery soma. Like uh, you hug a tree, you're getting earthy soma. And you try it sometime to see how good you feel. When you're stressed out, put your heart next to a tree, a big, healthy tree, watch for the insects. <laughs> Come down and bite you because I've done this. You hug that tree and you feel grounded and you feel like emotionally balanced. It makes a difference. It really works. And that is one of Bajamisha's tips for managing electromagnetic fields, EML. So you've got your uh, earthy soma, but then you've got your pure fire, pure flame, Agni stays as Agni, and then Marut becomes air and space, space and air as an element. And then those elements, as we know from everybody talks in Ayurveda, earth and water make kapha. Agni with water makes pitta. And space with air becomes vata. And those are our dosha, the three governing principles in the body which govern everything physiologically. But they are not a pure vibration. They are, Vajra calls them a semi-vibrational material. They have a material, there's a form there. You know, they are kind of abstract. He says, you know, Ayurveda is hard enough to learn as it is, talking about Bhagavad Kappa. So when I start, when I came and started talking about Soma Agni Maru, you know, people were lost <laughs> because I'm adding another level of abstraction there. But he said, that's what we have to understand. 
because water Pentecostal come from Somali Maru. Somali Maru comes from home. So you have to understand the beginning, the whole hier the whole hierarchy of the creation. So and uh, you know our sense organs come from these five elements too. You could say that the sense of touch, the sense of smell, the sense of taste, the sense of hearing, the sense of sight are all related to those five elements. He says, when you see the sight of something is the manifested aspect of the fire element. The taste of something is the manifested aspect of the water element. When something you touch, it's the manifested aspect of the air element, touch. So, but this is the um, great contribution that he has given us about this Soma Anima Rupa, because we need he says, prana is God's power. He always said, Bhattapit, you know, when you get stuck in Bhattapita Cup, you're, you're stuck. You want more prana. You want, what, can balance, what can help balance everything? Well, I, I'd like to just follow up on that mm -hmm. because, um, you know, on the, in, in Western medicine, we think of, um, you know, prana, the respiratory system, breathing. Um, but what you're indicating is that prana is much more powerful than that. Prana is not just breathing, it is your ability to breathe. Right. Because that's life. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you don't, you're not allowed, you don't breathe. So prana is not just the breathing, it's your very ability to breathe. Sure. It's that electromagnetic power that runs your heart. Of Keeps the heart beating 24-7. Yeah. Every instant, recharging, recharging. That is prana. So if the pranic energy is flowing well mm -hmm. and you're you know, your uh, person is balanced and has good prana, what does that look like? Health. Health, not having everything's in balance, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, every level. That's so how about... But, um, you know, we need, we don't get good food, that food that doesn't have prana, or we don't, get, don't have the digestion to get the prana from the food. Or we breathe in a shallow breathing, or we don't get to sleep. We're getting good sleep, we're getting more prana. Um, so basically, it's prana is that. But uh, so that I was just talking that ohm coming down the spine, right, and going everywhere. So that is uh, a the environmental prana, but in the air, breathing, food, all that stuff. But <clears throat> we also get prana from our own soul from our own jivatma. It's like a kernel. It's like which everything we saw, which everything revolves around. Your own soul has a light, which is called sattva, the light of the soul. We call it the soul. It's from the Upanishad text. Soul is like a gem, G-E-M, not my name, <laughs> but G-E-M. It gives out light. And that light is your aura. And your aura is interacting with the environment to get prana. When body life goes, aura goes. You don't, you don't see a glow around a body that's not alive. A healthy person has to glow, right? You see it, you see the vibration, you feel the vibration. From a, you know, the saint has the halo, that is the aura. It's the aura of the light of the gym. It's the aura of the light. And everybody has a different light. There are 16 types of light that we have. Some lights are very bright. Some lights are medium strength and others are low strength. So we want to have a bright light and we want that light to be active in our aura, in our mind, in our sense organs, in our heart, in our every, every, every cell. Because prana rides on the light. So you're getting prana from your own soul. That is your main source. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're getting prana from this marmot here. When, when a baby, you know, when Baja likes to say, you know, when there's an ovum, the sperm comes together, there, what's, what's there? Nothing, really. It's pure vibrational energy. It makes the baby grow. It has no connection with the mother at that point. There's no umbilical cord to receive nutrients from the mother at that point. What's well, making it grow? I need some on the root. Pure vibrational energy. And during the development over time, of course, mother's, you know, the mother's rasa, the mother's uh, 
circulation of food and nutrients. Also go to the baby, but uh, when the baby comes out, cord cut, they start receiving prana from the own, from the aditama. Sure. That's when it starts. Now, is that you're calling that the adipati? Adipati marma. Right. So. Can we talk a little bit about more about that? Marma is a huge topic. Well, just the day. adipati marma, and that it it really um, controls the spinal energy. It's the master and, marma, right? Yes. And how that nourishes, you said, all of the systems well, it's, and organs it's, in the body. Because it's mainly the root. Right. First, there has to be the root, right? Right. Intelligence and how that intelligence gets used. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we've got, we get soma from our nose, from our left nostrils, more soma, right nostrils, more agni, but they're all three flowing down the spine. Yeah. And, but, and the nadi system is very complex, 72,000 nadis, yeah. and where one nadi would transform, the intelligence of one nadi transform to the intelligence of another nadi. Yeah. It gets very complicated, but, but our body, our body does it. Yeah, but if we're thinking about like working with clients, mm -hmm. Um, and thinking about the adipati marma. Exactly. We have and the spinal energy. Are there ways that yeah, absolutely um, in working with clients absolutely. We that have, uh, we can yes. enhance that energy mm -hmm. absolutely. in the flow of We have uh Roger Mister. Again, as I mentioned, everything he talks said I have to be practical. Yeah. I can't just talk about adipati marma unless I can, I can make it function sure. better yeah. as it should function. So he has something called samadhi set in which we do mar marma on our middle of our hands and feet. These four marma connected to our vibrational heart. See, your soul is it's like a gem with a light, but it sets in the center of the chest within this vibrational structure called the heart lotus. It says 16 petaled heart lotus, which starts forming at some point in our development. This lotus, two drops of lotus for every. <laughs> they're shaktis, the mother nature, they're shaktis. And the purpose of that lotus is to protect the soul. From because the, because from, there are eight drops of ojas. Because there's eight drops that glue the soul to the lotus. And one drop is even a little bit less life okay. goes. So the lotus is there to shut down, to protect that glue, that paramojas, right. that eight drop. It's right. called paramojas. Yeah. Uh, so the lotus is like a protective thing, but we want it to be open. So when it closes, there's less light going to our mind. Then the mind is possessed by the sense organs, the horses, he calls them. And then we do things we shouldn't do that are not healthy for us. As long as we're, that's what samadhi means. It means our mental intellect is connected with our spiritual intellect. It's balance, sama means balance, di means the buddhi. So the mental intellect, and spiritual intellect was also called buddhi, but it's a spirit such a buddhi, it's a pure view. They have to be connected and connected with each other and communicating with each other so that we do the right things at the right time. But it's another whole lecture to talk about our slowness. But basically, I just want to people understand that pranic, pranic energy comes from not just material things out there in the environment, including our breath and food and water. But it comes from our very own soul. And we want to have our heart lotus open so that that light comes, and with that light comes more prana, which means better health. Right. You know. So when you talk about the soul and having a heart light open, are there, um, would you say that that's akin to living life in an open hearted way? Or is there something more to it than that? Well, it's not an, just an emotional feeling. Yeah. Uh, sure, our behavior will affect our lotus, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. But on the other hand, our lotus affects our behavior. Of course. You know? So he says, uh, so he developed some techniques called Samadhi Set to help open, open the heart lotus. Number one, that's always the first step. We have a special transdermals we use, Arjuna, Ashoka, mm -hmm. on certain arm on the hands and feet. Then we have a Brahmi, everybody heard Brahmi put on the pulse to make the mind able to receive the light. So it's one thing, your heart's open, but your mind has to receive that light, it has to be more powerful. So probably makes your mind better able to receive and use the, the intelligence, the wisdom coming from your soul light. 
And then we have Tulsi here and here. This Tulsi is a, these are all called Div, Divashi. They're very divine herbs. Divya means like a sky, like divine. Ashadi, the medicine. So Tulsi makes normal, a lot of times for most people, our, mind, our senses want to enjoy the world, but they need to be turned toward the wisdom of the soul, turned inward toward the light. So that the mind is, so these sense organs are not controlling the mind, so it's the other way around. You have to empower your mind to control the horses. You know, the horses, the senses are like horses. They're wild horses. Right. <laughs> yeah, they want to enjoy the world. Maja says, Mishra says, they're not coming. They know they're not coming back next lifetime. They want to enjoy the world. By hook or crook, they want to enjoy the world. He says, but we can't just put, beat the horses. We can't just force the horses not to do the things they want to do. He says, they'll put you in a ditch. <laughs> Eventually, they're going to put you, take you to the ditch. He says, we have to control the sense organs gently by turning the sense organs, making the mind more powerful than the senses, than the senses and making the um, organs themselves able to receive the wisdom of the soul's light. Guided, be guided by the soul rather than by the horses. So that's, uh, Tulsi is good for here and here. We call it Samadhi Se because it's great to do this five minute technique before you meditate. Awesome. You know, awesome. prepare, you're already halfway there yeah. for meditation. You're not distracted. Uh, well, I think that um, just to be respectful of time right. and the video that we want to start right. um, today. So today was really about Hana and right. uh, Hana is much more complicated than it appears um, and different components. And I'm sure we're going to continue on this topic next time. Is, is that correct, Jim? I can finish that up in maybe two minutes. Sure. Okay. Um, so again, prana has three components. Um, lunar energy, which gives stability and gross giving. Transforming energy, which trans so much to what the body needs, anything and everything. And then Marut, which helps to circulate, which maintains the intelligence of the soma and the agni, how much to transform and what to transform. So they all have their own job, but they're all three together in different proportions, according to what we're taking in from the environment. So, uh, and they create the supply Pancha Mahabhu. We, we talked about that. And then they create the dosha. We talked about that. So this is how we, we have to understand the raw material for Vada Pitta which is Soma Agni They are the raw material for Vada Pitta So he always says, Bhajan Mishra always said, I start, I start teaching Ayurveda two steps before the Vada Pitta which are in themselves already complicated enough to learn. Yeah. <laughs> right? right? Uh, but he does it. He's got DVDs and CDs and all the details of Vata Pitta subdoshas, everything. He knows it in depth. But you know, he wants you to understand what is the origin and how to use that knowledge of the origin. Um, so to close, I'm going to introduce what I was hoping to get to tonight. Absolutely, that'd be great. And I'll so use that as our springboard for next week. Awesome. Love to hear it. So Vajra Mishra always taught and he always practiced three sutra ayurveda called tree that's the sanskrit for three it's tree sutra means thread but literally it means the, the vedic wisdom which is like in a like a ball of a little like a little ball of, of cotton it's like a phrase which or... you can elaborate and stretch and stretch yeah. and talk more and more about if longer and longer and longer in one little pithy phrase you can elaborate books mm -hmm. so that's the sutra uh, so three sutra ayurveda says that uh, ayurveda was originally came from lord brahma the creator mm -hmm. and who's better to tell us how to take care of our body than the one who created it so that's where Ayurveda originated from, from Lord Brahma. It's like the owner's manual. That is Ayurveda. Is an owner's manual of your body. Who can tell you how to take care of it better than the person who made it? 
So that's Lord Brahma. And in the Vedic tradition, they believe that he created everything. Well, he is responsible for the creation and how to maintain it. And Ayurveda is the maintenance manual of our body. Um, so Tree Sutra Ayurveda, which was taught by Lord Brahma to the Rishis, says, you know, someone has a headache. You say, okay, uh, I think you should take this herb. I practice Ayurveda. You take this herb for your headache. That's not Tree Sutra Ayurveda. Somebody has stomach ache and they come to you. Oh, my stomach really hurts. Well, you know, take this Praval uh, Panchamrit or some other cooling thing for your stomach. Yeah, that's not Three Sutra Ayurveda. You have constipation, take Tripala. That's not Three Sutra Ayurveda. Three Sutra Ayurveda says that the Sutra, and my Sanskrit's far from perfect, so don't take my Sanskrit as an exact pronunciation because it's not. The, the sutra says, He tu linga aushaga yanam swastatu parayanam tri sutram sasvatam punyam bhubude yam pitamaha. Basically means, and I think we'll stop here after I explain, He tu is the first word, mm -hmm. which means the etiological factor. For example, you have a huge list. Or, or to really simplify the cause. The cause and causes, the hey to. For any problem, there could be a huge list of ideological factors for liver, for the headache, for the menstrual problem, for the heart. Could be almost endless list of why, right? That's the hey to. So that's the first part of the sutra, is hey to sutra. No, which means first thing, don't start thinking, oh, what am I gonna I want to give them this? No, no. First, what is the hate to? First thing, know what is the etiological factor for that person, not from 50 people you saw last month in your practice, but for that particular person. What is their hate to? You got to spend some time with that patient to know what the factors are. Could be a zillion things, a zillion factors. Then you have to know again. So, what is the factor for this particular person, and how that factor is creating the imbalances, uh, either becoming pre-disease condition or becoming or had has become a disease. So, that's the first thing to know. And I don't have time. I won't go any further because. But so, first thing we need to know. We need to practice this way of doing Ayurveda. I'm going to explain. Let me explain real quick what these terms mean. Then we'll talk. So, H2 means the etiological factor. Linga means the signs and symptoms. And Oshada means the medicine, the treatment, not just pills and tablets, but total prescription, total therapy, whatever that might be. So, you got to know the H2, you got to know the signs and symptoms. Particular for that hey too, then you have to know what herbs or other therapies will help with that hey too, with that sign and symptom. And um, so people who, who people who come to you, uh, it's called uh, um, the. Um, I'm trying to give a quick overview of this. So swast swastatu means the people that come to you are are desperate to get help. Basically, these are the Swasta Atu means, or who is Atu? Swasta is the person who is desperate to get help. So Swasta means help, but Atu means who is desperate to get help. So they're de definitely, so if you know these three factors, if you know the three sutra, you become Parayan, means you become the master. Mm. Parayan means real master, real knowledge. A vibe who can take care of all the people who are desperate to get help. So this whole sutra is explaining all these. If you know these, if you know three sutra, and you know how to practice it, and you apply it, then you become real master to take care of all the people who are coming for help. For help. Uh, so sasvat means eternal. So 
Three Sutra is eternal knowledge. And there's something here called the uh, punyam. Punyam means good karma. You get punya, you get blessings. If you do this, you get blessings, you get punya. <laughs> you're doing a great thing, so you get, you get the blessing from, if you know how to do this. The punya, the good karma. It's, a, it's very auspicious. He says that's the complete Ayurveda. It's very auspicious. Uh, and the Buddha Yang Pitamaha basically means, Pitamaha means Lord Brahma, like the great, 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 great grandfather is Lord Buddha of Ayurveda. Um, so this is coming directly, this sutra is coming directly from the Lord Brahma who created, it's from Charaks Mahita, but Lord Brahma made the body. He gave us Ayurveda through the Rishis, through all the other, well, great Ayurvedic physicians. Beautiful. So you have to practice three sutra Ayurveda. If, unfortunately, most people don't think about that in Ayurveda. And, and, and I, you know, I'm going to admit, when I first started by practice of Ayurveda, I didn't either. I didn't either. I was more focused, well, what kind of mixture of herbs am I going to get this person? Sure. This sort of, that kind of thinking. And, and, Instead of take, taking the time, okay, you're, you can't sleep. Okay, I can give them this, I can give them that. You know, you're thinking, I give them this product, that product. First, why don't, why aren't you sleeping? Are you going to bed at midnight? You ask questions. It's called prashna, you ask. Are you, uh, are you on the computer right before you go to bed? Do you have the TV on in your bedroom? Again, it could be a zillion theological factor. Now, well, do you want to pick up on that? Um, yeah, we'll further elaborate. We'll elaborate that? more about. On that besides, I, I rush. Data. I rush through. Three, three I, I think that'll be a good place yeah. to start for next. Time. But I want to give the idea that uh, to be parayanam. I'm not saying I am, <laughs> but uh, you know, to be that real master, you, you, Baja says, he he said, I honestly don't see how anyone could practice Ayurveda if they don't know three sutra Ayurveda. He says, I can't do a consult in five minutes. And just to repeat, the, the three sutra Ayurveda is determine the cause. A2. And the linga, the signs and the symptoms. You need to look at the signs and symptoms. Related to those causes. Right. And yeah. what was the third? The oshadi, what kind of medicine, what kind of therapy you need to give them. For. And then the, the you know, what, what's the, um, the treatment? Well, you know, the, you know, the knowledge. Mm -hmm. The gan of the he to the sure. linga, the oshadi. Sure. Okay. He says, you know, I have a. Uh, 300 some herbs in my inventory mm -hmm. at the prana center, but I can't give 300 some herbs. I have to know what will work for that hay to right. those signs and symptoms. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's not just giving even his wonderful Ayurvedic products, his transdermal creams, his transmu transmucosal delivery system with drops, mm -hmm. where he captures the intelligence of the herbs rather than the physical material, he captures the vibration. Which gets delivered immediately, doesn't have to go through the liver and all that. Well, I think this will be a great uh, topic. We can you can say a lot more about that. We'll start yeah. with that next time. Sure. Great. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jim. Really appreciate wow, it. Wow. Thank you.